This was a very nice uh, start to get our brains and, and uh, bodies thinking about dynamics. And uh, now I think Johan Rockström, who is the director of the Stockholm Resilience Center and also director of Stockholm Environment Institute, will, will uh, exemplify and discuss some of, of the insights from Buzz's work on, on the challenges we're facing on the globe as a whole. It's great, Johan, that you will do this half an hour, 20 minutes for us. Thanks, Kalle. Okay. And, um, and, and thanks, Buzz. And congratulations. We are in awe, of course, for all the work you've done. And, and what I'll try to do is, is more of an exploratory journey to share with you some of the concerns and also some of the research challenges that we think lie right at the front when you try to lift up the theory of resilience all the way to the planetary level. And there's good reason to take that challenge on because, as Professor Will Steffen pointed out, at the Resilience Conference, the first scientific resilience conference held here in Stockholm and hosted by the Academy and the Stockholm Resilience Center and ICSU in, in April and the Resilience Alliance, that we are in a very turbulent time. And no doubt is this reflected, as you point out, Buzz, not only in the big global environmental crisis, as the Nobel Prize laureate Paul Kurtzen points out, we are now in the Anthropocene, where, where we as humans are the dominating new driver of planetary change to the extent that we can talk of a new geological era. This turbulence, of course, means that I fully agree with you, Buzz, it's a great day for the planet, Obama and Buzz on the same day, <laughs> which, which, of course, is, is something, if the planet would have been with us today, would have been dancing probably as the whole African continent is doing right as we speak. And, and this is, of course, something we start seeing proof of. And in my mind today, this is probably the most uh, important line of all categories. And, and I can tell you it's not the drop of the Dow Jones Index over the past couple of weeks. It is the dramatic threshold of ice melt in the Arctic. And what is so dramatic with this is not only that it's a warning signal to humanity that the Arctic ice sheet has crossed the threshold, it also shows that science has blissfully failed. Nobody has been able to predict, with all the power of the models that we have, even in the worst case scenarios of the IPCC, this was predicted to happen in 50 plus 50 years' time. And suddenly we see complex dynamics pushed from complex multiple drivers, a threshold effect, and a much more precarious situation than we previously thought. Is anyone reacting to this in a sustainability or resilience paradigm way? No, we're just patching an incremental change and actually even planning how to exploit this new potential fossil fuel resource in the best way. As Buzz pointed out, we've seen it before in the collapse of the cod fisheries. We know that just outside the door here, we have another system that may have actually been pushed in the same way. The Baltic Sea flipped through multiple pressures of social ecological drivers, put in a state that we, unfortunately, as Swedes know all too well now, stuck in a new undesirable state where it doesn't really matter in the incremental change paradigm of command and control we apply today. We don't seem to get it out of that undesirable state. It happens in the social domain as well. We know that probably the first government on the planet has fallen on the climate issue. In Australia, seven years of consecutive drought gets a whole population across the threshold. Prime Minister Rudd comes in and signs the Kyoto Protocol as the first task in office, a major threshold in the social system, which, of course, many of us hope could happen also in the financial crisis, a constructive opportunity to use the crisis to revisit the Bretton Woods institutions and realize that the financial crisis is closely linked, of course, to the environmental crisis because it's all about excessive consumption in the end. Now, this can be represented, I mean, the dire state we're in, the Anthropocene, in the quadruple squeeze on the planet. And it really starts with the drivers of the human growth which is not only a population issue, it's really the fact, the cynical, unfortunate fact, that it's 20% of the wealthy that have caused the bulk of the problem, and we know that 80% have not contributed, but they aspire to our lifestyles. We also know that we have the 350, 450, 550 dilemma of concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, where the IPCC and the climate negotiations talk of 450 ppm of concentration of greenhouse gases to be the safe level to avoid two degrees plus warming, but more and more science showed that when we start understanding the complex interconnectedness of the Earth system, we probably have to head much, much lower. 
350 or below in order to avoid dangerous tipping points. We are already at 385 in CO2 and probably 450 in CO2 equivalent. But the International Energy Agency points out that we're heading very, very rapidly and unfortunately decisively towards 550. China builds one coal power plant a week, size equal to one nuclear plant in Sweden. So that dilemma happens, unfortunately, on a planet which is losing its resilience very, very rapidly. At a time in human history when we really need a resilient planet, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment shows that we have deteriorated ecosystem functions and services, which stands behind not only human well-being, but the capacity to buffer and withstand change more rapidly than ever. And then comes buzz theory and science, so well proven by a number of scientists in the world, showing that we are not at all in a mode where things move incrementally, linearly, and controllably. 99% of change occurs in 1% of events, as pointed out by Steve Carpenter, again at our April Resilience Conference. So all in all, a much more complicated and a much more tough challenge than we previously thought. Now, this has all been contributed, this understanding has, has been contributed to by the understanding that we have nonlinearities in multiple states. Buzz has already gone through that very detailed. There's very impressive empirical evidence that this occurs, but most of the research has been done admittedly at the local or regional scale of primarily not so anthropogenically impacted systems on, on the system itself, such as coral reef systems, lake systems, grasslands, impacted from the outside, but not in, in themselves. But very clearly showing tipping points through trigger effects and getting stuck in undesirable states. The question then is, how does this scale up and is there an agenda on the global level? But just before taking that step to share with you, well, so what is resilience then when we look at it in these systems that have been studied so far? Well, much of the research has focused originally, as, as Buzz points out, in the persistence, the ability to withstand disturbance and stay within a desired state and to avoid state change. But the way resilience thinking has evolved over the decades also includes the much, much broader realization that it also has the qualities of adaptability and also increasingly importantly, the capacity for learning and transformation. The ability to take on a crisis head on and not patchwork within a system which is bound to continue failing, but rather to innovate and renew. We see more and more, interestingly, applications of resilience thinking in the real world. You may have seen that the World Resource Institute in its latest world resources actually take on resilience as the basis of its overview of the world resources. We see applications from the Resilience Alliance, not only in communicating, but also in operationalizing and integrating it into, for example, catchment management in Australia. We see that the whole Green Revolution International Agricultural Research Organization, the CGIR system, is taking on resilience thinking in its next phase of work on water resources and development. In the follow-up of the MA, in dialogue with the private sector, in reviews of ecosystem services, more and more of nonlinear thinking is entering that paradigm. And the important study released just last week as one part in a larger project of the European Environment Agency on the economics of ecosystems biodiversity, even there we start seeing elements of understanding the importance to withstand and safeguard biodiversity as a resilience measure, as a tool to avoid threshold effects. So interestingly, the science is moving on into the governance and management domain. A very interesting example uh, known to many in this room, of course, is the resilience inspiration of the new way the Great Barrier Reef is managed. The realization that functional biodiversity in terms of sustaining predators to avoid overgrazing is a key of the resilience of the system and the large no-take zones in the Great Barrier Reef is an example of application of resilience in the real world and a, and a success story. 